I was filming a thing in LA and I went to meet Brian and had a chat. And then, but then I wasn't available and then the thing I was doing, they wouldn't let me out the contract and then I was and then I wasn't again. So it was a very torturous sort of lead up to it. I am quite a physical actor. I, I do sort of respond to things in a physical way and, um, and I think I think about the way a, a, a character moves um, first. Very thoughtfully, um, the film had a, a movement person to help me. He's called Terry Notary and he'd worked with Cirque du Soleil and his sort of circus background was good because Nightcrawler's supposed to come from the circus. And, but, but he's also worked on like um, Planet of the Apes and uh, the Grinch and things, helping actors find a style of movement that that is kind of unique for the projects. Remember that the shoulders come up, the oil comes up, over, around, over your shoulders and down your back. That's the oil too. Good. The presence of a superhero is is such a fine line between what's beautiful and what's ugly. <laughs> you know, it's it's incredible that how fine that line is when you're in this beautiful makeup and you're, you're you've got a tail and you've got you know these beautiful hooves on your hands and feet. There's a real scary line between what looks great and what can look really bad. So it's it all comes down to subtlety and the subtleties of the movement are really really important. What I like to do when we're, when we're discovering a new character is uh, start working on the torso. Just try to build the frame and see what, because the frame is the essence of the character. With this character, um, he's he's got a he has a prehensile tail and he's super flexible. So I thought it would, might might be interesting to kind of continue the movement of his tail through his spine and up through his shoulders. So. It started that way. I was so I just started playing with the idea of him feeling as though the tail was continuing up his own spine. And it's hard to kind of find something that was had the balance of being not too you know not too animal and and yet not kind of human and be able to be quite subtle yeah. suggest things so so it was quite uh, hard to do that and it's quite hard work because you know you, you find out the way to do it by jumping around and running about thing about the makeup is it getting up so early. I mean, actually that's a lie. The worst thing is there's, there's many worse things about it. These are some of the original designs for, uh, or co concept drawings for Nightcrawler for his tattoos. And this is uh, the first look we see him in, uh, in the White House uh, paint. We've changed this considerably, <clears throat> as you'll see in the movie. There's, a, there's another concept. These ones here are very close to where we're going. Each of these symbols are our conjuring symbols. So they, they conjure up angels. Each one conjures a different kind of angel. Those symbols have been around for like thousands of years. Um, and this is very close to where we <clears throat> to where we end up. See, but he did put some shadows on here. Uh, I, I see all that. I, I'm not disputing that. I, what I'm, what I wanted to see was design, some kind of like dark, now light. It's almost like. Sorry. Do we have a wet nap or something? Let me see. There we go. Go right there, bud. Yes. Oh, this is gonna, this is gonna really take anyway. stuff off. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll clean you up. Yeah. Um, Almost yeah. like the, like no, the it's, it's just tears off. Yeah. 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 Ye
something like a faint, faint thing, faint thing there, but more faint, where a green, for instance, is there's a green underneath here, and then oh, I have. Kind of yeah. Of yeah. A gr like, own, yeah. like there's a green here, and then it bleeds into the green. The blue bleeds into the green. So we're Do not. You know I mean? So we're so we're not concerned that it's. No, we, we can put more colors here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The blue. The, it's primarily the blue. The blue will overshadow things. The green will just bounce a little bit. And there's these tattoos that go on. First of all, that are sort of raised tattoos which you have to transfer to my face and then you sort of syringe you get these syringes it's like it's like icing a birthday cake they kind of trace out the patterns it's absolutely a nightmare from hell we have special syringes we just basically line them on over top of the uh, transfers and it gives us a raised scarring pattern it takes a long time longest part of makeup it's hard to have anyone invade your space at that time in the morning, let alone two grown men with airbrushes. And also the airbrushes are really cold. They, make, they, they heat up the paint about as soon as it goes into the air. It's really cold in the day. <laughs> you an idea of what he has to go through. That's only the first coat. And um, these are the elements that we've built for him. These are his, uh, these are his feet. And there uh, he has a, a custom-made leather boot inside here with elastic, with elastic that slides on. So we uh, slide them on and off. They're quite comfortable, a custom fit to his to his own feet. And this is his tail harness and his and his tail. And we interchange these tails. There's a spring steel inside uh, these things. So it's all based on the premise of the of um, gravity and movement. So rather than try and puppet it with strings and stuff like that, we let his own body movement manipulate the tail. So it's a very natural movement, and, you'll, and I'll show you here how we uh, how we make those connections. We just uh, unscrew these, and the rod slides out, and we can put a new tail on with a with a new rod and new configuration. And we have tails like this that have armature wires in them that we can just bend to whatever for like wrapping around a, a tree or something like that that he's that he's hanging from. And his teeth, I had those made in England. And his eyes are made in England. We got you off the drugs. You should be easier to wear too because you're Without that cataract. Yeah, so do they? Don't they smoke off in the center of the nose? Yeah. It's like Chinese torch, I'm constantly poking. I mean, it's like three or four hours of makeup, depending how well I behave. Mm. And ten hours when the day that I did my whole body. I mean, that was, that was with three people at me for ten hours. It's just maddening. You want to like lash out, punch people. Never, ever again. <laughs> ever the sequel. We have to talk.
Last one of production is FX2 visual effects. FX2 visual effects. In this film, in X Men 2, they, the, the entire story, the setting of the story is larger. The canvas is big, so the effects can be big. This is a green screen. Whatever you're seeing on the screen, it's actually green right now. But that's but that's the way we shoot things. You know, it's like you're surrounded by blue screens and green screens. So you have no idea when it comes to special effects what my glass is going to look like. I mean, it may be, my glass may be different this time around. I don't know if it's going to be right now. You know, so it's exciting. When, you know, when I saw the first film, it was this. You know, I need to work on the movie. It's like everything's put together and the effects are in. And this type of movie, um, when principal photography is over, you've made about half. Uh, I don't often share my inner thoughts about the work that I've done on a film, but I do have to say that there was quite a bit of it in the first one that I was not particularly happy with. It was a, it was uh, a good workmanship work, and it, it looked pretty good in the film, and obviously it didn't hurt the box office. So I think it it was successful, and we nearly got nominated for an Academy Award. So I think I think we were we did a pretty good job. Um, but uh, having lived with those shots, uh, you really know what you want to do better. And I torture myself for years after I finish a film about all the things I could have done better. And X-Men's no exception. In the last film, we had about 520 shots or so. On this film, we're probably in the seven to 800 category. And the first movie's effects were simpler and smaller. Our effects here are larger, much more ambitious technically, much more ambitious aesthetically. There are a number of big challenges on X-Men, and uh, I would suppose that if I was going to break it into sequences, that the, uh, the <clears throat> X-Jet flight and the dogfight that ensues is quite a challenge. Mike Finch started us with a, an animatic that he created of what he wanted to see from a choreography point of view. And we duplicated that, knowing that we had to build a system to go create tornadoes and sky and background. Everything in the shot is on the computer. There's, there are no real elements, technically. We knew this from the beginning. So we used the computer to go and choreograph exactly what Mike had in his animatic to start there and figure out where the ground plane would be. And at the same time we were choreographing and making sure Mike was happy with the choreography, we were building a system for the tornadoes. On uh, X-Men, I was the lead uh, setup TV for the tornado sequence. So I worked on all the R&D for how we were going to accomplish creating over 100 tornadoes for the dogfight sequence in X-Men 2. I think we have probably more twisters in the first two or three cuts of this chase sequence than they had in the entire movie Twisters. It's all fiction, and so when you have something like that, you have to make sure you have knobs so that the director or Mike Fink or even myself can play. And that's what we did as we built these ones. So what we're looking at now is a finished composite render from uh, one of the shots in the tornado sequence, the dogfight sequence. This is the second shot that has tornadoes in it, and it was a particularly difficult shot. Um, it has nine tornadoes, and they're growing out of the cloud deck. So what we have is nine tornadoes that have all been created with volumetrics and particle systems. We also have a cloud deck, which we had to merge into seamlessly. So this is the final composite of our image. Uh, but where we start is way back in animation. As the effects team, what we get is we get a file with a camera move along with tornadoes that have been created by our animation department. So we take this information and we go ahead and build 
a particle system around this and then take that and put it through a volumetric render or jig to get the final result. What we did is we created a system that would really allow us to quickly build a tornado that would match the wireframe that came from animation. What we have is we have our tornado skin. From this, we extract a spline or a line that runs right down the center. It's kind of like the backbone of the tornado. And on each one of those points of the backbone, there's a certain attribute that tells us how wide the tornado is at that point. So on each point, we know what the radius is of the tornado. And this is one of the ways we maintain the shape. And then what we do is we use an orbit method, and we have these particles spin around their point on the backbone at a set radius and a set speed. We have a number of controls available to us also. So we have control, of course, over the speed of how fast they orbit. We can modify the radius of the orbit at any time. And you'll notice that if I were to make the radius much larger, the particles are actually um, going to orbit much slower now. So we have some calculations that will adjust the speed based on the radius of the tornado. Once we've created our particle system and brought it back in to uh, copy geometry over, what we're going to do is we're going to take this geometry and put it through the process of rendering. This is where we apply surface properties and apply lighting to get the finished image. So here, this doesn't look very much like a tornado, but after the rendering process, what we end up with is these nice volumetric soft tornadoes that really feel like they have a lot of mass to them. So what we do in this process is we have currently these spheres or these balls copied to each particle. When we render this, each one of these turns into a volume. And the easiest way to think of that is think of them as a little ball of fog or a little pocket of fog. And layered on top with such depth, it really becomes almost a surface of material. And this is how we represent our tornadoes in the final render. So the rendering process is really the key. This is where we drive our look. This is where we control kind of the quality of these tornadoes. So the motion is the base. And that's really what kind of controls the feeling of how these tornadoes are integrated and moving in the scene. But the rendering process is what really allows us to tie these in and make them feel like they're in that scene with the jet, with the sky, and with the ground. So really our goal with the tornado setup was to create something that would allow the artists to really spend time with the quality, with the look of the tornadoes, paying attention to how thick the mist is, and also how dark we get in the shadow area, and how this tornado plays with the light of a sunset. Nightcrawler, of course, has the ability to transport or teleport himself at will so that he can move from one spot to another whenever he wants, so he just leaves a little puff of smoke behind. There's this word that is, he goes bam, like B-A-M-F, and that's the sort of noise he makes, and then he just, like, you know, he just disappears, and then he bamps someone else. So I think how we do it in the film is like, you know, basically you just cut, and I, I've done some stuff where I'm like teleporting onto a wall, and all these people are uh, pointing guns at me, and then, and actually, I just, I'm up there for ages, and in the film, I'm up there for like a second because I bam off somewhere, somewhere else before they shoot. We're going to create nightcrawler bams fairly traditionally. In other words, we shoot him, we shoot the scene with him there, and we shoot the scene with him not being there, and then we take the two and we combine them with a little bit of digital manipulation, and uh, and then he reappears and disappears. Uh, all of that's been created digitally, not doing anything practically on the set. And the, uh, the whole effect is a little bit like a thunderclap, because if he disappears from the scene, he would evacuate the space that he's in, the air would rush in to take up that space. And as it rushes in, the smoke he leaves behind would be disturbed and dispersed into the room. Initially, the art department uh, generated a series of pictures. Uh, I think there were basically five to six frames in total, which was a hand-drawn animation. So this is the original Banff uh, artwork that was uh, basically the starting point for what we tried to achieve uh, in computer graphics. Um, really, it's, it's about a, uh, a five or six frame um, series of drawings followed by a very crude uh, particle animation. So on the first frame, this is uh, you know, the image of Nightcrawler with um, no processing. Um, on the second frame, we start to see the smoke uh, 
moving outward from him, his his body kind of you know tearing away from itself. Then on the, on the next frame, you know, that progresses slightly. Then on the next frame, you know, big change. We start to see the smoky guy in the center. You kind of still see his eyes right there, and uh, starting to kind of uh, collapse inward. And then even further, I mean, immediately he disappears. And by the fifth or sixth frame, he's this this bunch of smoke that lingers. And that's the original BAM. Most of our technology was actually based on. Um, based on fluid dynamics for a water simulator. Um, we found that, you know, through our research that it gave a very nice quality and a very fluid quality to the smoke that was immediately recognizable as smoke, but also, uh, you know, more dynamic than, let's say, a, a puff of smoke would be. It begins in, you know, a series of layers that represent, you know, first the blast outward, uh, you know, smoke from where his body was. We then take a series of elements anywhere between, depending on the shot, three and five of these to create, you know, a multi-layered effect. Another layer is our interactive layer, which, you know, depending on what he's doing in the scene, um, these represent tendrils of smoke that are pulling off of his body. And so as he's punching or kicking, you would see, you know, strands of smoke pulling off of him. Uh, and in the color, it actually, you know, we pull part of his actual color um, to, to color the smoke. So there's two um, sets of colors, the dark smoke that represents the blast, and then there's the, um, there's a, the color smoke which takes on his actual color. And so these kind of elements, when combined um, in the comp, create a look similar to this. So you can see here, there's a combination of black uh, smoke with smoke that is colored to his body that he interacts with. Um, the combination of all these, you know, create uh, the BAMP effect. Plastic prism is back. It is based on the same plastic prism we had before. It was built exactly the same as the last one. Adios Magneto itself was built the same. But we've enlarged it now, and there's a security screening area. The ramp that we had in the last film uh, with the big plastic shroud around the tunnel didn't uh, open and close, but this one we've made to actually on camera, open and close, so we don't have to do all of that in CG. We just do the wider shots in CG and leave the tighter shots to, to camera, which is wonderful. When we had Ian in the cell, we shot Ian doing uh, virtually all of the action in the cell on that set, although we removed the first third of the cell because we were going to replicate it in CG. From this point out, we're reconstructing that on the computer so that it can be broken. Yeah, everything you see breaking and falling down is all CG and matched to the live action set. This, these sets of doors, this ring, all this glass that's breaking are on, done on the computer. It's very hard to do this on a set and to have somebody work, walk through it. It's also even hard just to have someone on a green screen and put them back into something like this. It's also hard to choreograph breaking things that easily. So. Mike decided that he wanted to have control over it, and we proceeded to do it. When you break glass, it's actually um, a hard thing to do for us on the computer. It's a very natural event, and each of the pieces, um, you don't want to go and have an animator animate the multiple thousand pieces that are here individually. Uh, so what we do is we procedurally program again, and we say, Gee, that's a piece of glass. I'm a piece of glass. I have boundaries, and as I fall, I'm going to have a little bit of rotational component to put to it, and I'm going to hit things. And when I hit, I'm going to hit and rebound in a certain way, and it'll fly off. And by the way, I'm also going to fall uh, by the force of gravity, which is 32 feet per sec per sec, and it's going to look really natural because I'm going to do all that stuff sort of like a physics simulation. And indeed, 
the broken glass is sort of a physics <clears throat> simulation as the glass falls down. We did define how the glass is going to break and define the pattern by using an artist. Nori painted us a picture of the glass fracture pattern. We didn't want to write a program for the glass fracture pattern uh, and waste the time to do that, so we just hand, hand drew it. So it's a combination approach. For scenes like this, there's nothing that we can do with uh, lasers or markers of any sort that's really going to help the actor. It's, it's all in my eye and Brian Singer's eye, so we watch the imprints and perform, and I say to Brian, I think he's looking too low. I think the balls are higher than that. And then Brian says to Ian, Ian, can you raise your eye line just a little bit? And Ian looks up a little bit, and Brian looks at me, and I say, yeah, that's good. And then we go ahead and shoot the shot. And it's only because in my mind, I know where those balls are. <clears throat> and we can give people, actors, eye lines for where we think things are. Um, and sometimes we use lasers to give them a dot to follow, so if it has to move, you know, or a light bulb. Sometimes it's a, just a marker on a stick. Sometimes it's just a tape dot on the wall. Yeah, we do things like that. Cerebro was developed uh, by many, many hours long conversations between me, Brian Singer, Stephen Rosenbaum, supervisor here at Cinecide, uh, and quite a few of the Cinecide crew, uh, Lubo Kristoff, who's an art director here, uh, trying to come up with a conception of how, what Cerebro looks like when those walls fall away. How do the walls fall away? And then when they fall away, what do we see out there and how do we see it? How does it turn on and off? And, and how far can we see? And what happens in between? Because we're seeing infinitely deep. How much depth can we build into the shots? The problems with that, that environment is it's this big spherical space. And uh, you see a map of the world, essentially. Mm -hmm. And you see people uh, on points of the map, uh, spread across points on the map. Uh, what we wanted to do is, is make it dimensional, bring out some depth into space between where Xavier is in the center of this spherical room um, and reach out towards towards these people that are projecting off the surface of the map. It's virtually uh, all digital, uh, all the atmosphere, um, all the effects you see in Cerebro, once that stuff is, is all three-dimensional CG. Um, the, atmosphere and the rays and a number of the other things that are happening are all volumetric so you get a real sense of distance as you look down light light that moves affects the volume of the particles as they're in there's a huge i like to say that this show is a very is really about particles uh, particle animation is a very powerful tool in cg and in this film virtually every effect uses particle animation in some way my name is Ed David Satchel, and I'm a CG supervisor on the Cerebro sequence, which comprised of 80 shots and uh, about 20 people helping out in the sequence. I'm going to take you through some of the shots here. So this is a previs shot, which was um, the very first part of the shot generation, which is just to get the camera moved and what's happening within it. This is part of the Cerebro effect, um, where there's a lot of people represented within this space, and, and Xavier is trying to find um, mutants in it. And this, and also, I can show you one of the elements, which is a more final version of this effect, which is very volumetric. It's pretty cool. I can show you where Magneto comes into uh, Cerebro, and this is uh, uh, interactively where, where the animators work, and what he does in this shot is come in and he moves tiles around with his power. This is kind of what it looks like when you play it back. Then when we go, this is a very rough shaded version of it just to get the timing of the animation. Then uh, what we do is we do various different passes. Um, this is a version of that to give it more shading can see here to give it a more start start to get a more realistic feel in, in, uh, in it. and then here, here is kind of it the way it kind of uh, 
looks all put together at the uh, final stage. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Cerebro. We have an entire sequence with a dam break um, and a huge wall of water that comes crashing through the woods. And the miniature dam we're building is actually uh, possibly even too small. Um, but it was as large as we could build, to be perfectly honest. It was, uh, it was 24, 25 feet high and about 85 feet wide. This is a miniature dam, and miniature dams hold back water. Water never gets to be a miniature like the dam does. So the bigger you make the dam, the better the water looks. And, uh, and so the scale is an arbitrary scale that we sort of made up because we came up with an arbitrary size on the dam. So it's somewhere between quarter and six scale, is what you'd say, which is way too small for a dam. It only represents a small part of the dam, so we're not, we didn't take a thousand foot pipe dam and scale it down to 85 feet wide because that would never work. This is just a small piece of that dam. And, uh, and that's how we're making the water effects work, is that rather trying to achieve the world, we're trying to grab pieces that are large enough, as big as we can possibly make them, so that the water scales properly, and then we sell the wide shots by a combination of miniature and digital enhancements so that we, we don't get caught in that terribly underscaled water problem that you see so often in shots like this. Basically, uh, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is one of the larger pieces of the puzzle, yeah. as it involves a lot of water going through the tank, but in the past weeks we've been putting smaller amounts of water through cracks and fissures and putting them in such high pressure to not only uh, correspond with the, the, the model to make the water look like it's the right size, but also by pumping the water at such high pressures, it, it gives it a finer quality. Because it's a very, the, the biggest problem with models in water is, is just size. You, you, you almost need to build the model to actual scale. So there's all these tricks involved, and some of them are CGI and some of them are or high pressure water that enable you to create the illusion that the water is the right size. As you'll see, you know, it's, 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 the, it's one of the most challenging things. I haven't come a long way since Superman, and they did a pretty good job. And uh, you know, we're trying to take it a step further. It's starting to pump water up to the dam. I need somebody on the other side. Lock it up, lock it up. Lock up the dam, lock it up. All the water in here will be drained in about three minutes put up in the tanks just in time for them to build up the pressure. And then the pressure will, the pressure will send it out. I, I just regurgitating what other people tell me. Set and raw cameras. cycle through and have the have that portion drop or tomorrow we'll just rebuild the under section and run it again but it's all about pieces so I think today will be good for the initial big break good though pretty cool it's a lot of water it's a wonderful experience actually to do a sequel even though many people say oh, I want to never do sequels <clears throat> but in fact it gives you a chance to build on the things you've learned from the previous film and 
what we always say is that when we finish a movie, we really know how to make that movie. But in this case, that that's a benefit for us. It gives us a leg up.